Warm welcome to my, to my talk, uh, which is entitled One AI Program to Rule Them All, Stanford's General Gameplay. And I hope th this talk will be a bit different, a bit less programming heavy than the others. So a few words about me. Uh, I'm currently, I'm a, a scientific manager at Silver Bullet Solutions and we are making an AI, no, not really an AI, we are making an engine for AI in games. Uh, my, in general, my, my areas of interest are artificial intelligence, of course, 3D computer graphics, Windows programming, any kind, any sort, and algorithmics. These are a couple of affiliations I had, or I have, and uh, in particular, I want to focus on two. I was at a research uh, exchange in University of New South Wales in Australia, where I investigated cooperation between machines and humans in the activity of game playing. And also I want to focus about my, my biggest passion, which is playing the guitar. So I will start with a quote which is quite old right now. Uh, AI systems are dumb because AI researchers are too clever. What did he mean by that? Well, the AI programs usually, which are handcrafted for a particular area, are usually require a lot of time and effort, and it's repetitive effort because each time they are developed from scratch. They often lack classical AI techniques be because they are embedded, they are imbued with the intelligence coming from the, their creators. And it's very hard to generalize a very specific method, which has been thought for a long time by, by the creator for different, into different areas. So it's not really universal and it's very hard to transfer any knowledge. And here I will talk about general game playing, which is a bit different. And in general game playing, the, the, the rule is that we are creating programs which are capable of playing a variety of games and play, playing them well. And it's, so, it's a kind of going back to the roots of the AI. And here, programs do not know the game they will play. It can be a, even a new game. They, they, they must play the game they haven't seen before. They must figure out how to play. And it is often said that the game playing programs which are specialized lack universality, creativity, and intuition. And here we are tackling the first one, the universality, because the other two are still, still very, very tough and still a subject of ongoing research. And here we want to transfer some responsibility to analyze game, to display intelligence from the developer to the program itself. I'm not answering if we succeeded in this. Uh, this is the, the idea, this is the goal. And where does the, the name general game playing come from? It, the term was coined in, by the Stanford University in 2005. Uh, here's the web page, and each year the world championships of the GGP programs are organized during conferences, during scientific conferences, one of two, one of the two. And the number of participants varied from 9 to 29, uh, it's, sorry, 49 of course, but it's, it's really the, the top programs which, which are competing. So usually weaker programs do not even, uh, the, the owners, the, the developers do not even register them. And here, the, here is the overview of the winners so far. So it might be interesting that not many countries actually won. And there are, th apart from maybe Iceland, it's, it's quite obvious that like the States, Germany, France, and United Kingdom. And <coughs> and the last column, it's, it's MCTS, and I will describe what, what it means later, but all the programs since 2007 has been using the algorithm called MCTS, which is 
kind of a brute force algorithm, but but with some clever ideas in in it. How how the competition looks like? We have game manager. This is the central unit, and it's a communication hub. It oversees game, and it's it functions as an arbiter. Uh, it's it's a client, so each player needs to be a server. So we need to have the the connection, the public available, it's like public IP to, to take part in, in this uh, competition. I, I started from Warsaw University of Technology. I was there, basically. And the, the responsibility of the manager is to send the rules of the game to be played, to handle time limits. We have two times. One is start clock. It's an initial time to, to think about the game. It's usually about a minute, so it's not, not much. And play clock. It's time to make a move. And usually if, if a program makes two invalid moves, illegal according to the rules, it's, it's eliminated from the game. Well, it loses the game. This is like an exemplar communication. Uh, th there is some th it's done via HTTP. So there is a header, and this is rules of a very simple game. I won't get into details of that. And this is uh, an, an R communication. Here we have game, game manager. It sends the rules, which I showed before, and then the game starts. The player responds ready, and then we have new match. It responds with actions, and the game manager informs all our players about the actions of all players. And here it th is the sim is a simplified architecture of my program. So we have a game manager, which, which is external. We need some kind of a front end to handle this HTTP communication. Then I, I sh I'm showing a player controller, which is basically a, a, a controller to, which decides how to make a move. And it asks um, kev heavy algorithms inside, which do Calcul uh, calculations, which move to, to choose. And the, these uh, algorithms use a simulator for the language which the games are described in. And we have the, uh, what simulates games, and we have the, the language interpreter on the very bottom. How to represent games universally. This is about this language. And in Stanford's general game playing, we use uh, the so-called game description language, GDL, and it's based on, on Prolog. It's a formal uh, logic programming language, and it's based on Datalog, which is also a language for, for logic databases. And uh, we can use Prolog interpreters to, to, uh, to deal with GGP, but I did something different, which I will show in, in a few slides. So, in short, in general game playing, we don't have any rules of the played game encoded in the program. They are runtime parameters. As I've shown, they are sent via HTTP. And I will uh, tell only about the, the very structure of what, what is in G, 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 GDL. Uh, but I had some slides which go into details of GDL uh, for the uh, one-hour talk, but I, I decided not to remove them when the, the talk was shortened, uh, but rather than leave them in case there are some questions about the GDL. So in general, to play any game, we only need to de define roles in the games, the initial state, the next state, the, the how to make a move, or a player does a move, and whether a move is legal, what's the goal in the game, what's, what's the goal to achieve. The game can be cooperative, competitive, with any number of players, even one. Some co they are called puzzles then. For example, a Sudoku puzzle was once one of the played game. And terminal, when the game ends. And, and some additional auxiliary keywords, which, which are needed to, to do, do some logical reasoning. But that's only the, the only keyword. The, any other things must be defined by the author of the game. Even uh, additions, for example, mathematical operations, needs to be defined for every argument wi within logic. <coughs> and these are the slides about GDL, which I will skip. Uh, in case there are some questions, I can return to them. And 
just move how I dealt with it. So one way to use GDL in practice is, is translated to prolog. It is quite easy because it's just a semantic translation. The syntax is the same, just different notation. And we can also translate it to another long logic language, like action programming, for example. But this will require some, usually, of course, syntactic translation. And we can use and ready to use uh, GDL interpretation engine, for example, a GGP base, which is written in Java and it's available. It's not very fast and speed is crucial here. Or we can write our own interpreter, which I went for. And so <coughs> this is a very low level programming here. My program was written in, in C sharp, but this part was written in C++. It's quite low level. And here <coughs> I had, if you ever write interpreter for, for a language, which m m can, must be used for any input, it's really, really important to, to think about your tests. And rich regression tests are, are really needed here. Well, the, the main topics right, while writing my interpreter were preprocessing, so dealing with the language analysis, building some kind of uh, structure to compile it then, to use it f faster, and actually using the interpreter to, to, to simulate games, to, to reason within the games, to manage uh, memory, which is also a very crucial thing in while dealing with, with lo unknown input. Recursion, also in logical language, is something to, to, to which makes problems. And of course, there are lots of optimizations. And here, I, I don't know which games my program will be playing, so optimizations mu must be quite general, which is also very, very troublesome. <coughs> and what's the problem with GDL? Well, if you take a dedicated uh, game engine, for example, for chess, so you, it will usually be much, much faster. And even though uh, I optimized my interpreter heavily, it's, it turns out be, I will show how fast it is, actually. So here we have games in the first column, and then we have number of complete playouts of a game like from the beginning to the end, random, random playouts, uh, per 20 seconds. So we can see, for example, in checkers, there are only in two most common prolog in interpreters used for, for scientific activities, there are only about 200 playouts, complete game playouts in 20 seconds. So my interpreter had more than 400, and I am showing how much faster my interpreter was in the consecutive games. Uh, here's the first part. Here's the second part. So on average, my interpreter turned out to be either five times or four times faster, depending on which uh, prolog uh, distribution we, we compare with. And especially YAP, yet another prologue, is, is regarded as very fast. But it's still, it's in relative terms, we should be making more, more simulations per second. But it's the cost of universality. Okay, my next topic is how to actually play. So in games, it's, it's very common to use some kind of heuristic evaluation function, static game, evaluation, uh, game state evaluation function. But we don't have such function in GGP because there are so many games and these functions are usually crafted for, for specific games. And automatically created functions based on some statistics usually and simulations do not really work that, that well. So we, have to, we had to come up with something different. And the solution which like every program is using at, at the moment is Monte Carlo research. And this method d doesn't require a state evaluation function. Basically, the method is the evaluation itself. It was a breakthrough in games such as uh, Go. Also, it was a breakthrough in GGP, as I've shown. Since 2007, all the winners have been using this, this method. 
and s pardon for, for Polish uh, subscripts, I, I'm, I'm com totally aware of that. The idea is to use statistics of the completely run, uh, of the complete games. And basically in, in the classical approach, like min-max approach, we make a cutoff at some points, uh, we, we evaluate states and propagate those results higher. And in Monte Carlo research, we go further to the end and we have the actual outcome of a, of a simulation because we are making lots of simulations and we propagate, the, propagate those results up. So it's, a, it's a, a general idea of the Monte Carlo method, which do random sampling. And by the way, the Monte Carlo method, the, the term was coined by a Polish mathematician, uh, Stanisław Ulam. And in Monte Carlo's research, we, we, we are building a game tree, but in a repetitive manner using statistics. We, we are slowly adding new nodes uh, to the tree in the expansion process, one by one. We make a complete random playout of the game, like a random simulation to the end. We fetch the result and we propagate statistics. And the, the first phase, selection, I will tell something more about this first phase. Phase. We are in selection, we are the, go the, the task is to choose the next node to explore within the part of the tree which we already have in memory. How it's done? Okay, I already uh, explained uh, the phases, uh, how it's done. So let's travel to Monte Carlo. Imagine that we are in a casino and we have N one-armed bandits to play with. And our goal is to play and maximize our outcome, our cash. And we assume that each bandit has an unknown distribution, cumulative distribution function. Yeah, and the question is which machine to play next? So this means how to explore how the machines behave to find out which one is the best and, and not to lose as not to lose much money, because the obvious way would be to not to play it at all. But well, there is assumption to play. So the 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 result is, well, the, the solution is to use this formula. So if you see someone in a casino looking at their notes, they might be using this formula. So the the, the solution is to check the each bandit once and then. Uh, play with them in such way to maximize this this uh, formula. The first part, the QI, is the average payoff, so it's exploitation factor, and the second is the exploration factor. So we want to know more about this. And this idea directly translates to the selection process in the game tree. We just switch notation. We have a candidate action and we want to make such an action in a given state to, m to maximize this, this formula. One is the average uh, assessment of the action so far gathered during the statistics, gathered during the playouts. And we have number of previous visits to this state we are in currently and the number of samples of this particular actions in this state. There are also other formulas, but this simple one, this, this first one, which has ma mathematical background, really works uh, for many games. Now, uh, now what th the simulations I, I talked about, the, the playouts of the games in the initial formulation of the, of the problem are random. So can we do more? And actually, I found that we can, uh, and I was using one, not many players, not many programs in this GGP competition went this, this way. I think I was the only one who was using a strategies to, to guide this random simulation. They were not random. I, I introduced some bias uh, to, at some point, choose uh, actions to according to some mechanism. So I introduced playing strategies uh, to carry out uh, a simulation in this argument, in this uh, algorithm. And I also, because we have so many games and we don't know which game our program will play, so I, I introduced some mechanism to find 
dynamically during the, the, the simulations of the game, which strategies actually work. And here is the image from Wikipedia Commons about no free lunch theorem, because in no free lunch theorem, basically any heuristic algorithm is uh, equally, on, on the average among any problems is equally good. So for a particular program w problem, we need to find a, a, a good heuristic method. So I employed a very similar uh, formula to the, to the ones shown be before, like UCB and UCB, to find which strategy to, to choose. And I made an abstract strategy. Mm. It was a good, uh, it's, a, it's a slide to, to bring some more coding and some more um, language coding related stuff in this a bit research talk. I made it an abstract class um, because any strategy can be can be different and they can require lots of f very specific fields for themselves, but at the same time they have a similar interface. So I, I, I introduced an abstract strategy and it implemented some kind of in a requirements interface which requires from the simulator of the game to, to make, for example, look at the next steps and choose one or something, and a scoring system to actually choose the next step. And I, I only used uh, a couple of strategies. Uh, one was random, one uh, was a greedy approximation of the goal, so go to the goal as much as possible in a greedy way to the goal of the game, or use actions which historically have been good or maximize your number of moves you can make, your actions, or explore the state space as much as possible. So find new components of the game's state, uh, or do some statistical analysis, or try to find some scoring in the game, which is inherit inherent in the game. These were my strategies. And in some games, such as Othello on the left-hand side, the strategies among time, this is the percentage progress of the game, on our, our normalized progress of the games. The 100% is the average end of the game. Lots of strategies were competing for, for the best one. Here is on the uh, y-axis is the, the like strength of the strategies. Here is an allocation, but it, it means it's the, the more the strategies allocated for, simulated, for simulations, the, the, best, the better it is. So the, some, in some games, the strategies were competing. And on the other, hand, on the other side, so in some games, the, there, is, there was one clear best strategy. And the last topic I want to, to talk about is parallelization. And why is it worth to make parallel GGP programs? We, almost all programs, mine too, were based on simulations. So the more simulations are performed, the, the better the, the method it is. So the, the, best, the, better s the more confident statistics we have. And also the constraints are, are really harsh. So we need to, to do as much as possible within this time. Other programs, competitors are also paralyzed. And also the strongest computer players such as Deep Blue or AlphaGo recently were distributed in their famous matches. And uh, the last reason is that computing power is continu continuously getting cheaper. And to refer, to back up this, I have uh, a table which shows what was the approximate cost of one gigaflop, so one um, billion operation floating uh, point operations per second throughout the time. So now it's only 8 cents. And uh, in the year I was born, it, the one gigaflop costed more than 18 million dollar of dollars. Which is, I think it's, it's awesome. Well, it's mind-blowing how, ch how cheaper and cheaper it gets. <coughs> so I, I, I ran my program at Warsaw University of Technology. I used one of two setups. In 2012, I used six, uh, six computers with two processors each and six cores each processor. 
And in 2013 and 2014, well, 20, 2013, 2014, I used 30 basically home class PCs. Yeah. And to achieve such a, such a parallelization um, scaling, I introduced two layers, one way to parallelize within the machine and one to, get to parallelize the, the computations among the machines. <coughs> I think uh, uh, maybe the details are not that interesting, but the, the one of the important things are that the Monte Carlo simulations are much better par paralyzed than the classical algor algorithms such as min-max, because each simulation can be done in a separate thread. Yeah, so this is a, a scheme how root parallelization worked. Each game tree is one machine. Within the machine, we have uh, parallel. We have uh, the so-called tree parallelization method. So each thread do does uh, simulation and gathers statistics uh, and provides statistics. And the master node between the machines merges the, the game trees among the separate machines. And here's the l couple of links if you want to get started uh, with GGP, but uh, the entry level is quite high because the, the top programs are really, really powerful right now. And s my best result was uh, reaching a quarter final in 2012 and 2014, uh, 2014. And the it's, I know it's surprising where, why uh, my first and my last entry was was successful, and not m and my middle one, one wasn't, and we had some mm, connection issues because, uh, really, sometimes it's uh, the the delays from from Warsaw to Stanford are high, and some peaks made my program lo lose some games. So in 2014, I was wiser to to do some more. Mm, mm, to, to to prepare for this and respond with my actions a bit earlier. Um, yeah, so there is an official site, there is a GG GDL specification, and there is also a general video game playing, which is quite similar, but it's based on playing not logical games, not an abstract logical games, but old video games, usually Atari games such as Frogger and and so on. And it's also uh, 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 it's also fun, maybe a bit m even more fun because we have the visual input, uh, seeing our our programs playing all those classic arcade games. And if you want to read more about GGP, the uh, one of the biggest European com uh, com um, communities in uh, in GGP are located in Dresden. Mm. And if you want to read my papers about this topic and other topics too. There's also a link to, to my uh, publications. So thank you for your attention, for maybe a bit heavy talks at some points. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm welcome to, to answer them. <laughs>